or we're good. It'll actually help you guide. This will actually make this lab a little easier if I step ahead. I can, if anybody needs to. Okay. This is technically next week's lecture. Um, I never know how long normalization lecture is going to take, so that's why I give myself some gap. Uh, this will allow me to actually do some, some actual practical type stuff next week, which is nice, which has to do with the design stuff. Uh, but the, topic, the next topic was data modeling. This is where I take the, all the flapping we've been doing and I bring it home to actual real, the, the actual process. And data modeling is an iterative design process. Do you guys, do you guys know what the word iterative means? Yes, it means it repeats. You do all the steps, you go back to step one, you go through it again over and over and over again. All software design is iterative. Um, depending what courses you take, you'll learn about the software, life, the software development life cycle, the SDLC. Believe it or not, there's a database design life cycle, the DDLC. It's the same idea. There's a series of steps you follow, and when you're done at the other end, you got a database. And then people change their make cha make changes, and you apply them to your design, and you iterate through it, making changes as you go, because nothing is ever perfect the first time through. Take my word for it. It never comes out perfect the first time through. I just want to make sure this is actually recording. It is good. <laughs> Would have been bad not to record this piece. So. There are eight steps to database design, uh, the actual fit design part at the end, the modeling. First step, you identify the entity types. You identify the attributes. You apply the naming conventions. Believe it or not, naming conventions mean something. You identify relationships. And sometimes the naming conventions, the relationships, you know, flips back and forth, depending. Uh, you apply data model patterns. Now, patterns I'll actually talk about next week. Um, but if I have a chance, I'll mention them quickly on the way by today, but I'll actually go into detail next week. You assign the keys, and then now this is when the, the primary keys are created. And as I've said, most of the time, you're going to end up creating surrogate keys for everything. You then normalize. So you take your data, you normalize redundancy, which we just finished showing you how to do, and it's, you know, overview kind of way. And then you denormalize. So you normalized, then you realize this is dumb, and then you denormalize. Sometimes when your design is very well normalized, it's actually slow. You slow things down. Whether you slow down data entry, when I did the example of the city, where you normalize the city's out its own table, then you realize it's totally absurd. It's totally unusable for end users. Because you have to have data structures that have to do with the different you know, ways things are connected. OK. Step one, identifying entity types. And some of you just asked me, you know, they made an assumption that it was only working with the data. This is actually where you, it has to do more with empty data structures. You find groups thematically similar. By thematically similar, it means things that are comparable. For example, students are thematically similar. Whether grade school, high school, college, university, students to students to student. You have a name, you have an address, you have email addresses, phone numbers, you know, thematically similar. And if you want to go one level past that, you could say people are thematically similar. We all have names. We all have identifiers, but, you know, we, that might be a little too generic. Um, other things that are thematically similar, locations, places. When you think about what's the difference between City Hall and... and um, the World Exchange Plaza. Now, those of you that aren't from Ottawa probably don't recognize what I'm saying, but there's this difference between City Hall and the World Exchange Plaza. Technically, they're both places, right? They both have an address. The addresses are different, but technically, they both have an address. The same for that. There's a type of structure that they are. Maybe that's just a different attribute. What kind of building is it? Thematically, these are the same. There could be events. What's the difference between a rock concert and an outdoor play? Maybe what's being presented is different, 
But what? There's a venue. There's an admission. There's a certain amount of space allocated for people watching. Maybe there's someone selling beaver tails. Who knows? Or beer, depending. Those are things that are thematically similar. They're not the same thing, but they're events. They're things that happen there. An entity type should only represent data, not a thing specific. In other words, when I talk about a student, I don't refer to just one student. I'm talking is generically applies to all students. I'm not talking about one specific what makes one specific student unique. I'm talking about what makes all the students the same. We're talking about the data that makes up not the student itself. And it should be what's called a normal entity. In other words, it only depicts one concept. In other words, a student is a student, a course is a course. You should not have a student course hybrid. Student is the course. They're thematically not the same, therefore they should be two separate entity types. Therefore, that's step one. You you do this on a very gross, broad stroke manner. You go, you know, you paint it in big, broad pictures at first into its biggest component pieces. Then you identify the attributes. We discussed this a little bit already, but essentially you want to um, identify the attributes, and it's it be cohesive with your, your concept. So, for example, you're designing a student tracking database. Therefore, in the student tracking database, you should contain at, uh, attributes that are cohesive to it. Do you care what the person's favorite color is? It has nothing to do with them being a student. Do you care what they have? I might care, but you know, as a student, we don't care how many pets you have. It has nothing to do with you being a student. Well, fine, if, if each dog eats a different piece of homework, that's bad. But if we don't care. The dog's not our problem. It's your problem. Therefore, it should be because if you don't collect information, it has nothing to do with what you're trying to collect. Normally, you want as much detail as humanly possible. More detail is better than not enough. For example, when you place an order, and at first you just place the order. So order was placed on May 5th. Another order was placed on May 5th. And then you have 10,000 orders placed on May 5th. And then the marketing guy goes to you, what time of day do people place the most orders at? I'm like, I don't know, I was just tracking the dates. That's too bad, I can't give you that information. On the other hand, if you were tracking the date and the time as a timestamp, you could actually do a little bit of you know math and draw a little graph that plots when the orders are placed. Maybe there's something magical about 11.30 in the morning. You know, 1,000 of the 10,000 orders came in within a half hour window, why? Then he can look at when their ads on the radio runs more often or when, you know, their ads were popping up on uh, the AdWords ads were coming up more often on the internet and they're suddenly going, hey, this particular campaign was running in the morning and we got more blips on the fifth right afterwards. This is a good campaign. Therefore, more detail is better. You want to track as much. So while you're doing this at first, you try to identify as much as humanly can. Some of the stuff you identify at this stage might be useless. But try to identify everything you can. Brainstorm. Stretch it out as far as it'll go. Now, striking a balance is challenging. And it always comes between the name versus the postal code business, right? I always use that as an example. How much detail do you need to track a person's name? Some software use a single field. And you get a person's whole name, right? And you're couple minutes later, depending on <laughs> where you're from. By the same token, some places you need to break it down. You want to know the people's first name and their last names. So you end up with first name, last name. Then you can provide a field for middle initial or middle name. Sometimes you need to include a suffix or a prefix. You know, Dr. John S. Doe Esquire, the third. Right? How much detail do you really need? If you have actually data that looks like that, you may not want to break it down too much because it gets ridiculous. But by the same token, if you want to find everybody whose last name is Doe, D-O-E, it might be a little harder to do if you're single. It depends on what you're trying to achieve with your data. If the person's name is just a label, that's probably fine. But if you actually need to look things up based on people, you want to break it down. 
It's like with postal codes and phone numbers. Postal codes. In Canada, there's six plus a space, unless you get rid of the space and still six, right? It's seven. But they've actually seen people that take the postal code and break it down into two pieces, three and three. Why? I don't know. And then suddenly they go international and they got this two-piece postal code that doesn't work anymore. They broke it down too much. It's pointless. Same thing with phone numbers. North American phone numbers have an area code, an exchange, and an actual phone number. These don't work for international. So if you ever plan to go international, you might not want to break it down. So you have to strike a balance. Just don't overdo it. Naming conventions. For those of you that have been working on Lab 3 have known me about my naming conventions. Naming conventions are important. There's common several different styles of naming conventions. Almost every company has their own. Basically, the rule is follow whatever they said they are. So you get hired. They say these are naming conventions. You follow them. And the longer you've been following one set of naming conventions, the more painful it is to get over it. I was determining my naming conventions for over 10 years, and suddenly I, had, I went to work somewhere else for a while. And I had to change my naming conventions. And he was at me for first month and a half because I kept typing things in the old way. Be flexible. A naming convention is best, just like in every piece of software design. When you write code in Java, you're following standard naming conventions because they pretty much standardized. You follow the rules, away you go. You follow the database design. And the key in the end is. Those who did the lab today, what was the C word I kept using? Consistency. Just be consistent. So pick a naming convention and be consistent with it. It'll make everybody's life easier. Okay. Then you identify relations. Now, everything in the world we live in relates to something else. One way or another. Actually, I even have a typo in there. Relates to something else. Something else. It is impossible for something to be completely not connected to something else. And that's the honest truth. Normally, if you're trying to find relations, you talk about your data. And usually the verb in the sentence is how things are connected. A customer places an order. The customers place orders. Orders can have one or more things in it. Can have. That's sort of a verb. You know, a tends an event. Those are verbs. Those are relations. So when you start using senses and you actually have two concepts in the same sense, that's a relation. You want to identify them and then you want to sketch. Normally you'll even want to put down the actual words, you know, customer places order. <laughs> Just so at first you have an idea of how the data flow works. Um, at this point, once your relationship has been identified, you also want to take care of the cardinality. For example, can a customer place more than one order? Yes. If you want them to place more than one order. Can an order belong to more than one customer? No. Unless you're nuts. <laughs> or you have some really weird data required from the American military where your hammer costs 50 bucks. That's not real money. But you know, so there are the odd case where, you know, possibly an order could have more than one customer, but that's, you know, not really real. And that's what's called the cardinality and the optionality. Can an order exist without a customer? No, because somebody has to buy it. Can a customer exist without an order? Technically, yes. Can, t but depending on your system, can you actually have a customer without an order? Depending, you know, you're an online t-shirt retailer. Is the customer going to be in the database since they bought something? Exactly. So that's the whole, is it required or not, that depends on your business model or your rules of engagement. It's not always just business information. Sometimes it's other from like medical. Is it possible to have a spleen without someone it came from? No. no I hope not. Because if you have a spleen without someone, someone's dead in a ditch somewhere. Just saying. You know, there are concepts where there is always an implied relation where there has to be a relationship. And you have to think about the data. Can a customer can a customer exist without an order? Of course, it can exist without a cust an order. But can an order exist without the customer? Never. Therefore, there's the optionality 
as in the order cannot exist. It's not optional to not have a customer on the order. But the or customer can exist without an order. So the orders are optional to the customer, but the customer is not optional to the order. Okay, apply data model patterns. Now, excuse me, I'm actually going to cover this one next week. This one takes a while. Uh, but there are, all data in the world has specific patterns. Addresses have a specific pattern. Pretty much no matter where you are in the world, your address roughly looks the same, unless you're in the UK. Their addresses are dumb. They have two cities. Yeah, no, I kid you not. One, two, three, some street in Wiltshire near some other shire. And they actually put that down as two separate cities near. It's just dumb. But it's just how they did it because they don't actually have proper division of their postal service. There are other countries like that where there are no zip codes. Why? I don't know. They just don't have zip codes. Or on the other hand, you could have you know other patterns where some some countries need more more than two address lines for what Germany comes to mind. Actually, England needs more than two address lines sometimes too, because sometimes you don't even have a street address. It's just how it's set up. Actually, our UK office is a perfect example. It doesn't. We don't even have a street address for a UK office, but it still shows up on a map. Magic. Phone numbers have a pattern. Email addresses have a pattern. I'll be discussing the different patterns next week and what the rules of engagement are. Then you assign your keys. So far, you know, you've know you identified your data. You know, when I did it on the board, we had the candidate keys. That's what you do now. You try to identify what could uniquely identify your data. You don't necessarily create the surrogate keys right away, but sometimes you'll look at the data and go, there's nothing in here that can work as a candidate key. Let's invent one. Yes, serial numbers. Essentially, surrogate keys are, n you have to decide. Can you do the normalization, which the goal is, once again, is properly decomposed, broken down data, where any given piece of information is stored in only one place. In other words, you want to change how a given state or province is spelled, you only change it in one place, and it affects everything. For example, Quebec gets angry because, you know, English people don't put the accent aigu on the E. So you update the database to have the accent aigu on it. And then the English people get mad because they don't know why there's an accent aigu all of a sudden in their drop down. But, you know, you update the one record, but because it just references that entity, they all get the update automatically. Okay. Then you denormalize. So, Highly normalized designs can suffer from performance issues. In other words, like I was saying earlier, performance issues is not just <coughs> excuse me, slow database. It could also be slow data entry, complex entry, as in the data, the whole process becomes a bottleneck at the at data entry point where somebody needs to go type put in a city and they got to pick it out of a list of 20,000 cities. Um, and actually, that's probably not even nowhere near the right, that might be North America. You know, you've got to pick out every freaking location that could be an address. And is it Canada versus Ottawa? Blah, blah, blah. And you put them all in, or do you only put some of them in? How do you decide? That's also process slowdowns. So sometimes you denormalize this, and you look at some of this data entry and go, this is dumb. This can never work. You break it down to smaller components. On the other hand, by the same token, the server architecture nowadays is so fast that they can handle complex data structures. Often the bottleneck ends up being at the end user side, where it's too much work for the end user, it's too much management. But you shouldn't use that as an excuse to make everything one long giant table either. It's you strike a balance, as always. Um, it can be used to improve performance on complex reporting. Now, I always like to use Amazon as my example for this. And I once knew how many transactions a second Amazon ran, but it, the numbers changed so dramatically in the last five years that my numbers are irrelevant. Last time I heard of something close to a million transactions a second on Amazon. Get you not. And it's you know, a million transactions worth a minute. 
And actually, I think it's actually gotten higher than that. Now, let's say at the end of the week, the sales manager for, I don't know, Ontario wants to know what are the top selling products in Ontario. Now, if they were to query the actual raw data structure, it's going to take forever. What you end up doing is you end up creating what's called denormalized tables or flat tables where you take the data and you rebuild it into a flat format. That's the most common use for denormalization. So you look at the data where it suddenly, you know, it ends up being this join from 20 different tables. It's too much. It takes too long. You end up simplifying it down to a single row. That's called normalization for reporting purposes. Um, denormalization to per for reporting. So, yeah. The denormalized stuff is usually processed nightly for batches. So what they'll do is on a nightly basis, they'll update the flat tables. No, it's not real. Sometimes it will do it partially real time, depending on how complex the data is. But if they're doing a million transactions a second, there's no way they can do it real time. Because for every one you do of those, every second, you'd be doubling, if not tripling, the number of calls a second. They got amazing uh, server architecture, but I don't know how amazing it is. Um, so when you do database design, you have to start somewhere. So I described the different steps. And there are places you start. There's exist working from existing systems or documents. Now, most designers find this one to be easier to work with. Why? Because they provide you with complete information if you're lucky. So you get hired by an old manufacturing firm that's still running on an old PDP-8. And for those of you that don't know what that is, it's a computer that's about that wide, about that tall, and you used to program it using punch cards. There are still companies running on them. Because why? Because they never die. And their business hasn't changed. But now they suddenly decide oh, they're managed, you know, company's been sold and they need to modernize. So they're going to provide you with a stack of documents that they use on a regular basis. Purchase orders, invoices, you know, customer orders, um, inventory tracking, all the usual stuff that makes a business go, you know, run properly. They'll provide you that stuff and then you start working off of that. You have concrete examples, you know exactly what the data looks like. It doesn't mean that you're going to keep it the way it is, it j but you know exactly what you're working with. And usually this has to do with legacy. There's old systems that need to be modernized and you're stuck working with the old data. Or you get the clean room implementation. I don't know if anybody here has ever experienced the the, a boss that had a vision quest. <laughs> one, maybe more than one. Where you're sitting at work one day and your boss, uh, the president of the company walks into your office and goes, I had a great idea. And then first thing you do, you die inside a little bit. <laughs> and then you cry a little bit. And then you put a smile on your face because you don't want to get fired. <laughs> but, and they say, I want to do this. Suddenly you're going, oh, I've got this concept and you have no examples of how it's done. No idea. Clean room. How do you deal with that? Now, there are some people that prefer that because it's a virgin environment. You get to do whatever you want. You're not stuck with old data structures. You're not stuck with old data. It's completely yours. But there's a catch. It's easy to miss something easy because you're working with a fresh environment. You don't have, you might be missing something obvious. But because you're working in a clean room, you have no idea. You know, it's like, the, like a kid that grows in a bubble. The kid's in a bubble his entire life. One day his bubble bursts and he dies from catching a cold. Why? Because he, somebody forgot to, you know, introduce him to germs. That's, the problem is with the clean room implementation. Sometimes there are wrinkles in the world that you don't take into account. So how do you go about the clean room? Is you have interviews. You actually sit down and talk to people. I'm sure there's at least you know, 20 of you in this room that want to work in computers because you don't want to talk to anyone. Trust me, you'll be talking to people your whole life. Even you probably ever did. 
You may have to have brainstorming sessions where you actually sit in a room with people and you throw ideas at the wall and see what sticks. You might have to do some research as in you go look for things that are similar but not quite the same and see what they did to give yourself some inspiration. You know what they say, imitation is the best form of, fl of uh, flattery. Is it the same? No, but it's kind of the same. Oh, they got some pretty good ideas. We're going to kind of rip that off. Um, then you have to think about the data types. And you have some questions you have to ask about the data type. You have to take, think about how big is the data you're working with. For example, names. It's always my favorite to use. How many letters do you need to contain people's names? Well, if you don't need a lot of letters to contain most people's names. Most people's entire name can fit in about 30 characters on average. On the other hand, if you're in for well, how many characters do you need to hold your average name? Just saying. Or if you're from Spain or Switzerland, there's things that affect your name. Or if you're from India and you're using the English alphabet to write your name, it's that long. It's just what it is. How big is the data? So you have to think about your data and you've got to pad it a little bit. Is there numbers? Are there decimal places? Do you think what kind of data goes into it? Is it a date? Should you include the time? Yes. Always. Always include the time. That shouldn't even be a question. If it's a date, always include the time because earlier I said more is better. You can always get the date out of a timestamp, but you can never invent time if you're not tracking it. If you're dealing with text, just how big is it? And then there's the last one. When I say just say no to blobs, blobs are a special data type. Depending on what database server you're using, it has a different name. New database designers love it. And then old database designers look at you and go, what the hell is wrong with you? Blobs stand for binary large objects. Now, what is a binary object? A song, a picture, a Word document. Those are binary chunks of data. There's binary data in there. It's not human readable. It's just you know zeros and ones, various other characters. Now, databases have the capability of storing said objects inside themselves. Some of them do it better than others. But you could have a database where you know you got the list of songs that you have on your hard drive. Back for those of us that used to actually you know download our songs and you know go pick them up off Pirate Bay and download entire albums and we'd catalog what we had. And then you know we'd have a little list that showed all oh, this song, this file name is this song by this artist. Database is tiny, 500k. But one day you say, oh, you know what would be even better is I put the song in the database. 5 megs a song, 7 megs a song, 20 megs a song. Your database went from 500k to a terabyte. And then your hard drive dies. And you lost your entire music library. Blobs are bad because the bigger the data, the longer it takes to back up. The longer it takes to back up, the more likely a failure is going to happen during the backup. The bigger the backup, the more data you've got to copy off your machine. It, it's entirely possible that you'll end up going right around the clock when the database gets big enough where the backup is actually impeding on daily business, which slows down daily business, which then pushes back the, the backups, which eventually you spend 24 hours doing a backup and nobody gets anything done. So the rule is if you think you're going to store a file inside the database, no. You just put a field in there with the file name and then you put the file somewhere on, a, on the drive. You decouple the file from the database, you just make sure the names match. That way, a file name is 255 characters, in other words, 255 bytes, as opposed to 5 megabytes. All right. Let's see. Okay, 10 minutes. Postgres data types, part one. Oh, there are some text types that we all like to play with. There's car, also known as character. These are fixed length strings. They always occupy a defined space. They've been almost deprecated. By deprecated, it means people don't use them anymore. They still exist for legacy reasons. Now, what is the problem with the characters? 
There once was a time these were for performance reasons. People said car, car fields are faster. Because if you did a postal code that is six characters, it always occupies six characters, no matter what. Or if you did um, a person's name and you allow 10 characters and you stored the name Dan inside of it, what would it do? It would put in Dan, one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever number of spaces. It would actually store spaces and pad it. And depending on the server, it would pad at the front or at the back, depending on how it behaved. Now, there once was a time this was really important. Remember when I was talking about the tape-to-tape -tape business? With the tapes, it was really important for the tapes to know exactly how far to move the heads. Right? It would roll the tape and says, oh, this is exactly six bytes. It would go, that would be the equivalent of six bytes. And then it needs to move to the next record. It knows it needs to jump 25 bytes. And it would move 25 over. It always knows how big it needs to move. How many of you are using tape drives on your uh, computers right now? None. The character, there's no reason for it. Postgres actually pretty much ignores them. It, it pretends they don't even exist. They, right in the documentation it says don't use these. They've been replaced, and this was years ago, like 25, 30 years ago, with something called Varkar, also known as character varying. What they do is if you define it being 10 long and you store the name Dan inside of it. It'll store Dan plus one. So it'll occupy not quite four bytes. This plus one is actually a special terminator. It's like a special binary blob, like a little binary piece of information that says, this field ends here. So it stores one byte, two bytes, three bytes, plus like half a byte. So it's like two bits or something. And this identifies the end of the thing. So in other words, instead of storing and wasting 10 spaces, you're only using three in a bit. That means now that the, the searches across the hard drives are faster because it doesn't need to go move set distances for s information. It just goes jump from one to the next to the next. It uses up less room. This was really important back in the days when hard drives are counted in sizes in megabytes, not gigabytes. When our server, like say example, System 36 had a hard drive. It was a 20 megabyte hard drive. It was this big. I shit you not. It was that big. And they were slow. But you know what? 20 megabytes is not a lot of room. It really isn't. So this became critically important because this used less room than this. So Varkar came to be accepted. All database servers are now optimized to use varcars. If you have text that's not an encyclopedia, use a varcar. Text is the last data type in Postgres. It's used to store large chunks of data, huge chunks of data. Postgres is limited in the gigabyte range. Basically put the, the maximum size of a text field is usually the maximum size of a file in your hard drive. And right now I think Windows, the maximum size of a hard drive is like of a file is 20 gig, maybe more, depending on what file system you're using. Obviously, we've got ISOs for games that are in 50 gig mark. So there's a limit, but you know, there's it's not a real limit. Um, if ever you have to work with MySQL and I inject it here, MySQL is dumb. It has three different text types: small text, text, and large text. Small text holds 255 characters. It's also known as a Varkar 255. A regular text is like 32,000 characters, and then large text is, you know, in the gigabytes. Number types. Integers. There's two. There's three sizes, 2, 4, and 8. The biggest one is a big int, also known as a 98. I don't know how to describe that, that number. And that's actually, that dash here is actually supposed to be a negative. It's negative this to positive that. And I, I mean, you go... That's thousands, that's millions, that's billions, that's trillions, that's quadrillions, and whatever the hell that is. Right? It's a big number. That is the limit, the biggest number you can put in a big int. Uh, if ever you get numbers that big, congratulations. Uh, you're doing real good. So then you got decimals and numerics. They're interchangeable. Um, a decimal numeric allows... 131,000 and change decimal uh, digits before the decimal point, 
and up to 16,000 and change. So from the period, you can have 131,000 digits, so 131,000 nines. And then on the other side, you can have 16,000 and change nines. It's a really big number, really lots of precision. And if that's not enough precision for your decimal places, you also have uh, floats, also known as reals. Those are used exponents to figure out your position in the whole math, where like, you know, you'd use a float to hold pi. There's serial and big serial. Uh, some of you have heard me have the description of this already in some of the class in the labs. Serial and big serial are metatypes. They were actually a big integer with some magic sauce. It creates an auto-incrementing clicker. So it goes one, two, three, four, five. It's an integer that counts itself. And then there's the money type, which I've had some people say, well, why can't I use money for when I'm dealing with prices? Money, number one, money is not portable. Not all servers treat it the same. Number two, notice. Only two decimal places. Accounts hit two decimal places. We do, all our, we do all our accounting at three decimal places. Why? The foreign exchange rates. When you exchange money from one country to the other, sometimes you lose half a penny, you gain half a penny. On a daily basis, those half pennies don't count for much, but you add them all up at the year, those half pennies add up to an awful lot of money sometimes. Therefore, money is great if you never need more than two decimal places, but realistically, you should use a numeric or a decimal. I'm going to stop after I'm done with the data types. Time, uh, these are dates and times. Timestamp with and without a time zone. It occupies eight bytes, just so you know. It contains both time and time, time, date and time. It can go back to 4713 BC to way in the future. In one microsecond increments. It can divide the entire history into one microsecond increments. Yes? No. A timestamp is a timestamp. And we're not talking about UNC timestamps. We're talking actually formatted 2018-05-22. Then it'll do like 22 colon 53 colon 53 dot 9999. Nine. Maybe another nine. Whatever microseconds are. So you can divide your entirety of known history into microseconds. That's why Postgres is really popular in the scientific community. You can store just plain dates. It occupies four bytes if you need a little more precision going into the future. 4113 BC to some absurd date in the future where the sun will no longer exist, will be a big dust, you know, be a red giant. Uh, time with or without a time zone. You can actually store just a time without the date. One again, microseconds of precision. You can store intervals, which is a cool thing. Most people understand the concept of passing time. You can actually contain the concept of passing time inside the database. In other words, I store a date time, whatever the time is right now, 648. And I can say, now four seconds have passed since 648. I can store a value of four seconds, an interval of four seconds. So whatever the start date is, plus an interval. It's a really cool way of tracking time. Okay, I'm stopping right there. So I'm on slide 15. <laughs>